All right. Good morning. What's going on, Bor? Hey, good morning. That's a cool song. I haven't heard it before. What, where is that from? You know, I, <laughs> I, I dug it up. Um, yeah, not many people have heard it. It's like this underground uh, little 8-bit song. I just, you know, figured it might set the mood, it's right? It's catchy. I think it's going to blow uh, up. <laughs> I think it has some legs, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, we, you know, first of all, welcome everybody to the first episode of Game Changers. Uh, me and Board have, uh, you know, been sort of playing this for the past couple of weeks and, and stoked to be kicking this off. Um, you know, it's a show where we're going to be, you know, covering, uh, a bunch of different angles on Web3 Gaming. It's a topic that everybody talked about and, uh, I think between board and I, we're, we're fortunate enough to, you know, have a lot of incredible friends, builders, founders, um, who are pushing it forward and, and, you know, going to make this thing what we all want it to be. So, uh, you know, we'll, this is the first one we'll trip through it. We'll have fun. It's casual. Um, you know, this first episode, uh, we thought it would be fun to look at, um, some TCGs, in the space, we think there's a lot of opportunity um, to take that you know mechanic, as as we all know, and, and you know use it on chain and and have some fun. So uh, you know, I'll let the the guests speak for themselves, but I couldn't be more excited. These are like some actual friends, uh, you know, IRL, um, and yeah, stoked to have them. Uh, we have uh, Sobi from Final Form. We have Give a Hoot from Runes TCG. And um, we have uh, Parallel on. I think Kalos uh, couldn't make it, but we have in his place, we have Merchant. Is Merchant here? Merchant on stage yet? Do we know? Unfortunately, I think he's having some technical difficulties. Uh, Hopefully he can join us soon. Uh, Yeah, I'm talking to him Discord. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, Well, I don't know. Sobe, I think the first what we wanted to do, board up is cool with you. We let um, everybody sort of have a moment just to sort of talk about who they are, what they're building, um, and then we can get into some fun questions. I think that's great. And also, Sobe, I think you should have the honor of explaining what TCG means if anyone is not familiar. Yeah, sure. Thank you, guys. Uh, Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, You know, to kind of echo what Bear is saying, you know, board, Bear, the the rest of the Forgotten Rune team, I don't know if Dota's on there or not. But some of my favorite people, uh, Parallel, also a big fan of those guys, so happy to be here and really excited to hear about the the Runes TCG. And so the word TCG, or acronym TCG, stands for Trading Card Game. So think, you know, Hearthstone, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Pokemon, uh, Gwent, all that stuff. Those are those are trading card games. And, uh, you know, we're building a trading card game called Final Form out of my studio called X Populous. Admittedly, <laughs> uh, we have been co- putting a lot of our... Uh, keeping a lot of the stuff we've been building close to our chest. Some of the people on the on the stage have seen it, and, and they can kind of vouch that it looks really good, but we're going to start sharing. It's dope! Yeah, it's gonna, it's good. we're going to start sharing a lot more, I think. Um, the benefit that we've been able to have, really similar to Forgotten Runes, is, you know, having patience and having time. In this space, people want things to happen tomorrow, uh, and we didn't want to create a culture for our development team where they felt rushed or anything because we really want to make a fun game. So Final Form is uh, a completely on-chain game, actually, which is the crazy part, but it's built in Unity, and it looks really good. You'll be seeing some footage in the coming weeks and months. Um, At the core of Final Form is this evolution game loop where you need to evolve your cards, which are uh, NFTs, uh, to Legendary. Now, the reason why you'd want to do the Legendary stuff is because we're actually going to be taking, I'm not going to say what number, but a pretty big chunk of percentage from the game and putting it into a DAO. Uh, We're using that as a way to seed the DAO. I think um, historically, you know, DAOs haven't really worked all that well in crypto, but I think empowering players is a really interesting uh, novel mechanism that we're excited to experiment with and see. And so, you know, if you have a legendary card, you you know, you you are the highest tier in this DAO, and you kind of get to decide with other card holders what's going to be done with this money. But beyond that, the game itself is very similar to like a, a roguelike, um, roguelike game, and we're calling it fr- a high frequency deck building. So it's an auto battler as well. So you basically build build your deck. You can buy these power ups called uh, well, I'm not going to know what they're called yet. We're, we're going over the names, and they have the cards have different abilities, and they you know they run into each other, and based on how you formed your deck and what your opponent's deck is, you will win. 
if you win, uh, you will win this thing uh, called Chromos. Chromos is a is a fungible token, but it's not a token that we raised any money off of or anything. So there's no VCs or any of that stuff. It's completely community owned. At the moment, uh, Solana it, or excuse me, at this moment, Chromos is non transferable. When the DAO and the game comes out, uh, when we have enough of you know the community and, and player base built out, the DAO can decide to vote to make it uh, transferable. There's a couple reasons why we did that. Uh, one, fungible tokens in games definitely make sense. You know, historically, games have tokens in them, whether it's gold, uh, blue essence, which is you know a token in, in um, League of Legends. We went with a different approach than some other people have done, and with regards to like not making it an, uh, an investment. Like it's very consumptive. It's bit used in the game, and there's no. Uh, it's all community owned, right? Because if if you have an asset in a game, it should be used in the game. If you look at a lot of the early GameFi projects, you'll see that the tokens in their games, they unfortunately use them as an instrument to raise capital off of and you know didn't adequately build a game, um, which is the big thing and build seeing. So there's that. There's a thread that um, Bear pinned above, and you know we're really excited to get it out. Another big thing about Final Form is when we designed the game, we had the idea that it would be really, you know, all these, Large PFP projects and communities. Forgotten Runes is actually one of the few that's actually doing it, but like they all say they're gonna, you know, build a game, right? So one one emphasis that we had um, with regards to what type of game genre et cetera would do well in crypto was well, what if you know we could give people, what if we created you know some type of game that allowed different IPs to come into the game? So I, I'm not gonna say who or announce anything on this state spaces, but we've been speaking to some of the best projects in the space about doing card sets with them. And those cards, uh, you know, will be, we'll have the art and stuff from the PFP projects, communities you love, and we'll get to come play them in a game. We're really excited about that as well, because I think it, it's just really, it, it's like that Smash Bros model, right? Where with Smash Bros, you, there's all, like I, dude, I think I'm one of the few people that play Smash Bros that knows how Chad Ness is, because I played all the, like the Motherbound games. And, uh, <laughs> and like, you know what I mean? And so, it's really cool to see different IPs in different communities mesh together. And we haven't really seen um, too much in, in Web3 with an emphasis on that, even though a lot of the ideals around it, right, is, is uh, composability and having different IPs cross over and, and re- limiting that friction. So we're going with that. And, and the last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll shut up with my rant, is one of the main reasons why we decided to make this game completely on-chain, which is made it very you know difficult but thank god we have a world-class engineer team with people that are way smarter than me um was one it, it's kind of cool it's novel right like you know having a fun game on chain that doesn't sound like some research paper <laughs> it was like a big goal but the the big thing i think that when you have games on chain or have game logic or game loops on chain that opens up the community modding aspect which is unfortunately a dying trend in traditional games because studios are kind of shunning the ability or, uh, you know, punishing people that are modding games in web two and, and, uh, in this industry and in this new era of new game studios, we want to encourage the community and in fact, support the community for modding. And, and, you know, to speak to that, like we see one of the members joining us today is building a card, a TCG game using forgotten runes and set in the forgotten runes IP. Like that's, really really cool right but if it was like nintendo or someone they would probably sue the shit out of them and so it's really cool that that's not happening yeah man i mean i miss let's get back to gary's mod i'm sure were you a big oh, gary's mod guy huge gary's mod guy that was like my whole thing dude i'd hang out in these gary's mod lobby and it was the craziest shit you'd have like the gravity gun from half-life and people would have like sonic the hedgehog in there and all this crazy shit and you're like this is so cool like all these things that I love and play with are all in the same thing, and and I, I can't believe you just said that, Bear, because that was the idea. Is like Gary's mod made it so easy with all these different tools and stuff that they had to import these three D files and, and manipulate them and enjoy them. And in the same vein, I think having um, game logic, game loops on chain, and having those smart contracts, and having uh, you know digital assets that can be composable and reusable can open up some really novel, interesting emergent behaviors from, from players and modders. 
Things I people were making it. Gary's mod was absolutely insane too. Like people spend hours. It was like Steam's first metaverse, really, when you think about it. But the things that would come out of Gary's mod were just absolutely insane. It was like so adjacent to Counter Strike. I'd see all my friends play it too, and it's just like wild what they'd make. Yeah, it's incredible. All right, well, let's keep going with the intros, and then there's a lot of stuff we're going to circle back. So be love what you're building, and yeah, people are going to lose their shit when they when they when you actually start sharing stuff. So. That's gonna be nice because I'm I'm sick of you holding it back. Let's go to uh, let's go to Give a Hoot. Um, Give a Hoot. Uh, this is you know Give a Hoot is an incredible person because like what Sobe said, you know the way Forgotten Rooms launched is is we really believe in this like sort of decentralized IP, um, and the only way that's possible is if we have true builders um, building on their own next to us. Um, and so Give a Hoot is here. He's created an incredible um, TCG. Uh, I mean, this guy has and and the team have, have just been working on this for so long. I remember I remember playing uh, like a demo really early on, walking us through. And so, give a who give a, give us a little. Thanks for joining and give us a little uh, little taste of what you're doing. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> thanks for having me. Uh, honored and humbled to to be up here and and so be good to good to chat and dude, your project sounds sick. There's so much in what you just talked about that could be dove into from the tokenomics to the layering IP on top of mechanics and interoperability. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so as Bear mentioned, uh, my name is Give a Hoot, building a, a TCG called Runes, um, which is a, a community project. But uh, you know, if you're familiar with Forgotten Runes, um, it's all about yeah, decentralized lore. Uh, you know decentralized world building and, and kind of a decentralized lore writing. And so Runes is kind of taking a gamified angle at that and kind of uh, adding to the Runeverse via, via a game because we all, we all love games. So, um, so yeah, uh, we're like, you know, so we're an NFT trading card game in the Runeverse uh, set, uh, the world being real realized by the Forgotten Runes Wizards cult. Um, the, the aim of the game is to kind of be like a fun, easy to grasp yet engaging uh, game with a major focus on like co-authoring and storytelling, we want lore and art and community to be the center of everything we do. Um, that's that's kind of like the secret sauce in our opinion. You kind of like come for the game, but then stay for, for those things. Stay for the community, stay for the lore, um, stay for like the customizability. Um, definitely, uh, so be hit on like, on kind of allow, like it's, it's all about empowering users, right? Empowering players. It's, that's the Forgotten Runes motto. That sounds like it's Finals Forms motto. It's like it's it's giving players the the platform to kind of build, um, and uh, and so yeah, I mean uh, we're going for like crypto mini game vibes, so nothing too complicated, nothing like Magic the Gathering, but uh, fun enough where it, where it's super fun. So uh, yeah, at, at its most basic level, Runes is like a card game. Player will use cards that are NFTs uh, that they've, they've collected through opening packs or or gifts or rewards, uh, and it's like a turn based battle. Um, where players play cards on a board and whoever has the most cards at the end of the game wins uh cards have stats and they can kind of take over each other and stuff like that um but at its highest level uh we want runes to kind of be like a complete multimedia experience where kind of social gameplay and creator cultures collide where um, we empower players to to create along with us and customize the experience where they can set a game in a setting that, that kind of conveys the experience they want and invite people into that lobby, into that world. And all of a sudden, you know, you go from playing just a simple game to actually being transported to a whole other world and kind of, and having that kind of immersive experience, which I think also is like a huge part of what Web3 offers. It's like you're combining ownership with, uh, with kind of AR, VR and frontier technology. It's, it's, they kind of, they have a lot of overlap. So um, that's kind of what we're going for. And, uh, and yeah, so we launched our private beta on the Polygon testnet uh, almost about a, a year ago, I think. Um, and then just recently deployed to the Polygon mainnet on February 1st of this year. Uh, and uh, along with that, launched our first core set. So it was like 64 cards um, with, uh, with basic alternative art versions to kind of like um, incentivize. It's kind of like almost like shinies. And, uh, and yeah, the, another thing that, one thing that we're going for is, uh, we want to be like super financially accessible to everyone. So packs start at minting at 0 0.005 ETH. Um, cause I think, you know, one thing that I'm sure game changers will touch on at some point, if not today is just like adoption, right. And how do you get more people to play? How do you get, how do you increase your reach? Right. And I think one of the things that can turn people off is just how expensive crypto can be. Right. And like, and so we wanted to kind of like, just there should be no reason why someone doesn't like mint a runes pack, right? So 0.005 ETH for a pack. You can open the pack on our website, get nine cards. 
and uh, and you know we've had multiple tournaments already. We've shipped multiple features. We've rewarded players with custom cards for like so. The first person who completed the entire card set got like a custom one of one piece of art card. Uh, not not statistically different, but uh, but really cool. And so, um, sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but uh, yeah, that's a bit about rooms. That's all good, man. That's great. That's great. Um, uh, why don't... Before we jump into the, the oh, yeah, next uh, intro, I just wanted to say for, for everyone, especially the Rudens team, uh, adding story and, and just deeper narrative to, to TCGs is so important. I think as uh, a player myself, I, I sometimes will get bored with the DCG or TCG because it just kind of like gets repetitive and there's not um, this this like story arc that keeps you compelled. Hearthstone did an okay job with sort of like seasons, but... Um, yeah, I mean, what you guys are doing in terms of like integrating the the really deep lore of, of Forgotten Runes into a TCG and just keeping it fresh that way is super important. Um, so, yeah, I know, I, I'm sure you're, you know you're thinking about that deeply as well. And um, it's great to have just this collection of people who are trying to do more than what players expect uh, from a typical card game. Yeah, it was super important for us to like to make sure that every card had a story, right? And so. Um, and I think cards are actually a really unique storytelling tool. Like it's different than like a piece. It's just different than text, right? Cause you have this, you have this card name, you have the image, right? You have the card stats. And then I played MTG for my entire life. And so one thing that I always loved was the flavor text of cards. Like I would like just, I would read through every, like my entire stack of cards multiple times, just reading all the flavor text. And so each runes card has like a lore blurb, we call it. And so, yeah, that was like, that was almost the most important thing about the card and like the card design was just making sure that it had a cohesive story. And one thing that also uh, we did to kind of like to double back on that was we also reached out to the runes, the the Forgotten Universe community and, and they were able to add cards to the set from like, from their lore, from the Runiverse. And so like, you start to kind of like layer these things on top of each other and you start to kind of create this like really like deeply nested web of stories and interconnected stories and all of a sudden, and like that just, I think is such a fertile ground for, for kind of like storytelling. So um, definitely was a, was a huge focus of ours. Hell yeah. <clears throat> so we have Hawkins uh, from parallel. Why don't you, uh, thanks for coming, man. And, and huge fan, huge, huge fan. We had a call with the parallel team. Uh, I think it was last Friday, me and Dota, um, but would love for you just to, Give us a, sort of a, a quick explainer. Uh, you guys are up to so much. Uh, let us know what's going on. Oh my goodness! Yeah, we are. We are certainly up to a lot. But yeah, it's nice to nice to chat with all you guys. It's awesome to hear about all of your interesting projects being built, especially the TCGs, because of course that's a bit of an area of passion for me. But uh, yeah, hi. I'm, I guess I'm kind of a, an unknown face on Twitter Spaces with Parallel. But just for context, my name's Connor Hawkins, or you might know me as Merchant. I'm the lead game designer for Parallel. Primarily working on the card game, although I'm also now working on our upcoming colony, which you guys might have seen, which is a um, very, very exciting exploration into how we can create gameplay experiences with AI. But oh my goodness, yeah, it's a, it's a busy time in parallel. We've been around for quite a long time. You know, I've been working on this for over two years now. We're just approaching our beta stages, you know, our sort of like public betas, if you like. So, yeah, all guns blazing, really. We've been up to a lot. Colony is in its sort of incubation formative period um, with so much, you know, sort of like different phases and different scopes being talked about for the future and how we really make that into something very special and something very sort of front running in terms of the industry and the genre. But, uh, yeah, very, very happy to be here and chat with you guys. I uh, I want to get back to it at some point during the show. And I'm bored. I'm sure you you want to hear about this, too, is... Um, the Apple uh, announcement yesterday with the AR goggles because I know that Kalos, <clears throat> who you work with, um, was was excited uh, to sort of see, you know, what that looked like. Um, and I know that a lot of things you guys are building um, could could benefit from a really fantastic uh, AR headset. So we'll get back to that in, in a oh, minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been super digging all of the posts with uh, all the, 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 the animated models uh, in AR. Um, I could go on a whole spiel about AR, I think. Uh, <laughs> I really want it to be a thing. I really do. But uh, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, we're, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be a bit of a time. I think, I think it's for sure going to be a thing. I think that's, I'm buying that thing. I can't wait to see the parallel cards in there. I've been, admittedly, I'm a, I'm a big parallel fan. I'm also, disclosure, an investor, a big fan of the team. 
Um, Merchant, I think it would be beneficial for people in the audience to know because as far as I'm concerned, I think you guys are going to be like the first live. We're gonna we're gonna go live later this year in beta. But you guys have one coming up in, in July, I think. You want to tell the people how they can get involved with that and. and yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, yeah. So we're going into our um, like the closed beta in july and you guys can go and sign up through the website make sure you got an account on there and there's registrations and what not to do but uh really just keep an eye you know make sure that you're following our socials and we'll be talking about it a lot in the run-up to it so i'm sure you won't miss anything um but yeah it's very very exciting i mean we've been at this for like i say i've been working on it myself from paper prototype over two years ago to all the way to being a fully fledged game and i think it's interesting because you guys hit on it earlier right you know Web3 in games, obviously, is a very controversial topic for like a lot of people who aren't sort of initiated. They might be coming at it from a place where they maybe don't have the background understanding necessary to kind of give it a bit more of a nuanced thought, I guess is the polite way of saying it. But, you know, it's very difficult. And you guys hit on it when you said that some of the earlier projects, while they had good intentions and they came very strong out of the gate because of the market that we were in, ultimately, they didn't really end up creating much of a game right and i think it's kind of about trust because you know quite openly i come from the other side of things like i come from the games industry i come from being a traditional tcg player a lot more so than i come from the web3 side of things like obviously working at parallel i've got very interested in it but still i would count myself as more of a games industry person than a web3 person so it kind of gave me an interesting way of I guess converting myself in the early days, which was, you know, an interesting way of seeing ways that we can do it. And I think it is about trust because as much as, you know, projects ask people to trust them and to maybe literally buy into them, right? Even if not with monetary value, you know, emotionally, they want you to be kind of dedicated because it benefits the project when you are. However, I think the side that was lacking was kind of, the trust being embedded in the players as well because how do you build trust with players you build a great experience that they want to continue experiencing so yeah i'd like to think that hopefully we're going to be one of the earlier people where people show up and try our game and i mean it's a game first ultimately you know yes we're a web3 game of course we utilize a lot of very cool things that we can do with that but from day one the mission was actually making a great game and then everything else came after that sort of core mission statement. So, yeah, we're entering how, how, a very, very exciting time. How dare you want to make a great game first? That's just terrible. <laughs> I know, right? It's awful. But, uh, and certainly, well, at, at the time, that was certainly, uh, you know, dare I say, not really the way in crypto land. We used to get asked all the time, like, oh, when's it coming out? Why? And, you know, this was like 18 months ago. Like, oh, why isn't it out? You know, why, why are you doing this? Just release it quicker. Oh, and it's, you know, when people make those statements, it's difficult because a lot of the time it's often motivated by they want to see number go up, you know, on their collection or on whatever they're speculating on. But it's like, look, we're building to really reinforce and reinstate the potential of what games like this can do. And I'm sorry, but that's like more important than an individual's desire to see number go up. Right. So we took our time. We built it properly. And um yeah, I really hope people are going to see that it paid off in the end. Yeah, and I was going to add, you know, the expectation for a game to prove itself before, um, you know, going hard on asking for for user funds or, or for people to spend their, their time mm -hmm. is not uh, unique to Web3. Uh, if you think about the traditional game space, like people used to pre-order games. And the reason you did that was because there were actually like limited physical copies and you didn't want it to sell out mm -hmm. the first day and you wanted to be the first person to play it as games became digital, that didn't really make any sense. And you saw the idea of like pre-ordering a digital download go down. People basically said, you know what, I'll, I'll buy it the night before or the day after, or after I read the first reviews that hit. But the idea of a game company going three months, you know, before launch and saying, Hey, pre-order this game that kind of died, right? Because no matter how much of a legacy you have as a game maker, you still have to prove yourself every single time you release a new title. Um, and if you look at free to play games, another example, right? Like show me the game is fun. Get me hooked on it. If I like it, then I'm going to, you know, potentially spend money inside of your game. And, and the bar for like the quality of the, of the game or of any game has to keep going up and up and up just because, you know, we have this mm -hmm. infinite library of games we can all play. So yeah, we're web three yeah. or traditional. It's, it's all just, you know, we're all solving for the same problem, which is how do you command attention? Exactly.
And when it comes to the game, yeah, you know, one of the things that I've repeated day in, day out to people um, internally and externally is, you know, no matter what we do, no matter how cool our technology is or no matter what sort of like leading edge cases we're utilizing, the reality is you are asking people to spend their free time playing your game instead of playing, you know, Hearthstone or Runeterra or going and playing League of Legends or Dota or Diablo 4, right? Like you are competing for a finite resource, which ultimately is people's time. And you do that before you compete for their money. So yeah, exactly. You have to build an engaging experience that people actually want to play. And that's just always been my focus from day one. I think the interesting thing is uh, I, they canceled the E3 year this year, right? I think, but I remember, yeah. you know, as a lifelong gamer, just this perpetual loop of really awesome E3 trailer. Right. And then now you're all excited for the game. And then five years later, six years later, or whatever, the game comes out and it's horrible. Nothing. Yeah. Like the I, I still remember when they when they released a, a trailer for Metroid Prime 4, which, you know, maybe will come out someday or your grandchildren will get to play it. But yeah, so <laughs> what you're saying is spot on. <laughs> but, but what's funny is like really everything. I, I'm going to have to run in a couple of minutes for a call, but I'm going to come back. But I, I think the funny thing is everything really is so cyclical, right? Like, there was a moment during the real big craze of 2021 with Web3 games where, like, for some reason, people were like, oh, this game looks so good. Like, it has to – they have to be putting so much effort, emphasis and effort into this. Like, it needs to have a bunch of money. And it's like, dude, that's just stock Unreal, <laughs> Unreal yeah. Engine assets. But I think, like, that's, that's when we get to, like, talking about – trust and incentives right and this, remember, this is only my opinion i guess i'm maybe a little spicy on this at times but like i think that sometimes in games generally you know sunk cost fallacy is a big deal we've all had a friend who's bought a game you've watched him play it it looks god awful and you say to him like hey this looks kind of bad and he will tell you for a day that it's the best game he's ever played and then never play it again that's sunk cost fallacy right he spent 60 bucks on the game he wants to believe it's good um I think we saw that cranked up to absolutely unsustainable levels in Web3 in the early days when people were praising games to the moon. And yeah, like you say, you know, as a guy with a bit of game dev experience in the industry, like <laughs> I was seeing things that were stuck on real getting called like, oh, this is the next escape from Tarkov or, you know, stuff like that. And it was just like, yeah, I think you want your financial investment in this to be a lot more valuable than it's going to be because it's very difficult to separate genuine hype from financially motivated hype in Web3. And I know that's something that a lot of people don't really talk about, but I think it's one of the biggest issues we face is legitimate projects need to garner the attention they deserve, right? Kind of like, uh, you know, people think when they sign up for a gym membership that because they're paying, they're going to go to the gym. But actually, exactly. But actually they don't. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, what exactly. Forty long. What did I ever do to you? Bro? Sorry, I, I didn't mean to call you out. <laughs> you know, your leg day, man. It's like it's like when you buy a bunch of autographed trading cards of like your favorite NFL team's sixth round pick this year, and then you tell all your friends that he's a future Hall of Famer. It's that's, like that's also what I do with the Chargers. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah, I have a lot of Dwayne Eskridge uh, auto cards. Don't worry about it. But yeah, it's <laughs> it's really that you know, and I think that sort of maturing in that sense and moving past that is going to be what helps a lot of web three, because I think it creates a lot of white noise for people trying to get into it. So I've had a lot of web two friends. Um, you know, all my friend group is really except a couple of guys, but they see these projects getting hyped and they look at them and they're like, well, this doesn't really look like anything good. And it's like, yeah, they just, you know, had a big mint and it's all the people trying to up its value essentially. So I think that, finding ways of moving past that white noise and encouraging sort of, you know, potential converts, if you like, potential people beginning to get interested and beginning to understand Web3, getting the real projects out in front of them, which is, I think, something that will come when, you know, like the people here or Parallel, etc. When we begin to have actually engageable experiences, you know, our game's going into beta, our game's launching, uh, that's going to be a huge help for that because all of a sudden people will gravitate towards what they can play not what they see being spammed in replies on Twitter. And I think that's a huge deal. Yeah, and I think I think the best antidote to that is time, which is, uh -huh. you know, which there's massive friction between, uh, yeah. you know, timeline and what people want now. Um, 
But, Absolutely. you know, I, I think, you know, I think everybody up on stage here, and I'm sure there's a bunch of people uh, um, listening in today that, you know, if you've run a business before, if you, if you're, if, if, if you're good at what you're doing and you, and you have expertise and experience, you have patience, you have built in patience because you don't have like these whacked out expectations for how long it's going to take to do something and you plan accordingly. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just about, it's just, I think time is the antidote. Yeah. I yeah. was going to add. Yeah. And just like to everyone building properly, like, you'll get your flowers in time, you know, like, yeah, you miss out on some of the gold rushes that occur during, but long-term you're just so much more sustainable. To that point, yeah, I don't want to make any enemies in this room, but I think Diablo four is a good example of that sunk cost fallacy. Like I'm sure, I'm sure it's fun. It's fine, whatever. But in a way you kind of have to admit you've got this massive player base who's been waiting for a really long time for a new game. They got thrown Mm -hmm. some, you know, mobile mobile title that basically was super extractive but everyone's committed a lot of their just their person like their their you know their <laughs> their teenage years or their 20s or their 30s to play it's a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. and i and i see everybody posting about it but i'm like do you really love this game or are you just doing because everyone's doing it and and i only really bring this up because not to shit on diablo but to the to the point of like new ip emerging and people building new stuff I, as a player, am a little tired of just kind of playing the same franchises over and over. I want new blood. And the reality of the game's business Mm -hmm. now is it's live services. You put out a game and it will last for 20 years. Like look at Grand Theft Auto V. It's lasted forever. So it it is hard to come in, right, with a new franchise and stand out. But at the same time, I do think there are a lot of players like me who, who, yeah, they don't want to play the next, you know, version of FIFA that's been updated 1%. They want to play something... Um, that's completely revolutionary. And, and I'm curious kind of how all you guys think about that, um, you know, breaking through oh. um, when everyone is playing these forever games that essentially is really hard to rip them away from. I love this topic a lot because um, I have such like a vendetta against like AAA companies that have really kind of strung along their fan base and community across all these titles and games and haven't given them like what they deserve. Good examples are like Diablo for sure. I actually have played like in the last seven, two hours, maybe like, you know, as far as I could get, like, 45 hours of playing that game because I love the Diablo series. Um, Call of Duty is a good example, too. FIFA, all these companies have, have, like, this dedicated fan base to their game. Yeah, they give such, like, an abysmal amount of money back towards, like, the, just the development of the game over the years because they always know they're going to come back next year and buy it because it's a cash cow, right? Like, super frustrating. And so, like, yeah, there's a real opportunity for IP to step into this space and give what the gamers, like, really want, which is just, like, development over time that makes sense for what the community wants, right? Like, and, and I will say, like, maybe fanboying, whatever it is, I do think D4 is the best version of Diablo since D2 Lord of Destruction, um, just by playing through it. But for sure, like, D3 and Immortals was, like, I was flabbergasted at, like, what they were doing with that game and what they thought would be able to be pulled off, right? Um, so yeah, just love that topic in general, because I think we're seeing that swap with games, you know, that are, um, in the space right now. And even in this conversation in the spaces, like pushing it forward for the gamers, like, and not <laughs> becoming a triple A company doesn't like, like lost the narrative, I guess, overall. And to be fair, I do like buy and play every Zelda game. So I'm guilty, uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, yeah. All gamers I, I do it. For a... sure. I think it's a very complex and myriad subject, right? Like, I think one of the um, mistakes that I see a lot of people going into games with is just the idea of viewing all gamers, or even just, like, gamers as a category, right? I think it's, like, a very outdated thing. We don't talk about, like, cinema goers, right? Because there's a whole breadth of, you know, offerings, right? There's all sorts of people. There's people like me where I go watch pretty much everything at the cinema, um, you know, including at, like, the TIFF here, which is, like, an art house cinema. And then there's people who just go and watch Fast and Furious when it releases. So I think that gamers in itself is a very, very broad category of people. There's everything from 12-year-olds who just play FIFA all the way to, like, you know, 65-year-old wizards who just sit and play Dwarf Fortress five hours a day. Um, <laughs> it's a huge breadth of people. So Goals. I do, underst- I do understand what, yeah, right? I do understand what you mean about, um, you know, wanting some fresh blood outside of the franchises, but... You know, I think it is there if you go looking for it, really. It just tends to be on the smaller scale of things, as most of these huge franchises started out. You know, there's a lot of fantastic independent games that have released. I mean, really, in the last 10 years, we've been in like a golden age of indie gaming. Um, So I think it is there if you look for it. But I understand what you mean in terms of like the mass or mainstream, if you like, hunger for new franchises. I do think we've seen some emerge, you know. 
We've seen games like uh, Horizon do very well in a new IP, and we've seen games like Destiny, if you go back a little further, become like a titan. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, as a as a sort of native game designer, it's uh, <laughs> maybe my number one gripe in life was I wish people were open to new experiences more, <laughs> <laughs> which translates into Web three adoption very well. <laughs> but um, yeah, generally speaking, I think it, I think it is there if you look for it. But I agree that. It would be nice to see some more mainstream appetite for it, for sure. Definitely. My backlog in Steam of indie games that I want to play is just like adding up day by day, right? Oh, like, mine's so, disgusting. Yeah, it's, I spend like 20 bucks a day on an indie game, and I don't think I ever play any of them, but no, it makes me I'll feel download better. it, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll download it. I'm going to play, right? And I'll find another game and download that one. But the summer sales really get you. But I still remember when I found like oh, Enter, yeah. the Gun- Enter the Gungeon, right? It's like a really good example. Oh, that's of a game. wicked one. Yeah. yeah, it came out of nowhere. Everyone's like, what is this game? I started playing it. Everyone absolutely loved it. Like, and the internet like took it and said like this is this is what it should be going for with like roguelikes and roguelites. So it's like yeah, I just have yeah. to go searching. I usually dive into Steam a lot of the time because that's like where I like you know I'm Steam kid, right? So a lot of people here probably use Steam a lot of the time. So, but yeah, you just have to go searching, right? That's all you gotta do. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so question for you guys. Um, and I am no TCG expert. That's why I have board here and I have Jitsi and. I have some amazing people on here that you know are building in the space, but I think for me, like uh, when it comes to breaking out, whether it's an on-chain TCG or it's or it's not, like what do you think the components are, and and how are you, and how are you guys sort of approaching getting those like first thousand fans? Um, maybe give a hoot. You can go first. Uh, you haven't you, you haven't gotten to talk a lot, but um, would love to like sort of understand what you think makes a great TCG. Um, and you know how you're start. I have a I have a hunch on of, of how you're gonna sort of you know spark user engagement. Um, but would love to hear you talk about it. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think um, it just first just in general, like when I think about blockchain, blockchain technology, what it enables with games. Like, I don't know if there's a better analogy between like an NFT and a card, like. I feel like those two fit so, so well together. I mean, <clears throat> there's such a natural fit. Like people, and I think, you know, like ownership's a huge part of it, right? And so people understand like owning a trading card because that's that's what you do. You actually own trading cards in real life. And like, I'm talking about physical trading cards, like where they came from. There's obviously digital ones, but like, but when you play a, like a real TCG, you're you're owning the card, like in real life, you have it in your hands. And in some ways, it's even a stronger analogy to like digital ownership than maybe like, you know, an item in Warcraft, because in that analogy, the person's actually doesn't actually own it, right? They own it via a centralized server. And so a trading card game, again, I think translates super, super well to the NFTs. And, um, and so just to like even get a little like philosophical, I've always thought that the value of blockchain provides is almost analogous to like IRL physics, where like the physical world conveys an existence that like that, that two people can agree a tree exists without anyone having to say that tree exists, right? Like we can both see it. We both. And so like blockchain allows things to exist digitally. Like, uh, and that's like, so trading cards exist digitally. And so, uh, that translates to NFTs perfectly. Um, and, uh, and so first of all, I mean, I feel like that, so like when you, I, and there's a huge hurdle when you bring a, a oh, board, do you want to say something or, Oh, no, I was going to, I was waiting for you to, uh, you know, please go finish. I don't want to interrupt you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think selling, selling crypto, and this even just like harkens back to literally the past 20 minutes of us talking, selling crypto is hard, right? Because it's, there's tons of white noise. There's tons of scams. Who, who do you trust? Who do you believe? Um, and like, and it's so easy for, there's such a, a barrier when you bring up crypto to people because they are so primed with so many negative emotions, bad experiences, rugs, things people say, media, like misinformation. But like, if you are able to kind of tell someone and like really sit them down and, and kind of convey like the value of what blockchain provides, I feel like the use case of an entity for a trading card is almost undeniable to the point where like, a gamer will understand what you're talking about. Like, oh, like, cool. Like, I played Hearthstone before, but yeah, I can't trade my cards with anyone. I can only sell it back to the to the game to the game like house, right? Like, but oh, you're saying like and like and and same with like Magic Online. It's like a little. It's just they haven't those haven't been really true translations of TCGs into the digital realm where like NFTs really do enable that. So I think like that's something we do have going for us. Like. NFTs and trading cards are a very, very natural fit. And I think just make sense to people who are open to 
a bit of a change, like a bit of a, a paradigm shift. Um, so that's like fun, like foundationally, I think, I think like how TCGs will start, will like, will break into um, main, like, you know, a, a new audience is just because the, the model makes sense. Um, you know, we're, I know like there's, there's, you can layer complex tokenomics on top of that, but just in general, like just from a very foundational perspective, that's how I think that's how like the technology will sell itself almost. Um, I could go on to like, you know, there's also like, I think board, you mentioned things about like new IPs and like new and fresh blood. And I think that like creating new stories is going to be super important. Like that's how, like, you know, Zelda didn't, Zelda wasn't an amazing franchise before it was, um, you know, before it told its first story, right? Like we need to like tell new stories. I think that Web3 brings in a whole other set of tools to allow us to do that. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a few, a few of my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I was going to add the, the analogy of physical cards is, is so powerful just because I think that um, NFTs are restoring a bit of a balance that's necessary with, with, with trading card games. So when, when you had games early on like Magic the Gathering and Pokemon cards, as you said, they were physical cards that you held in your hand. But if they were really valuable, you didn't hold them in your hand. You held them in a plastic sleeve and you basically never played with them. And what happened over time is that you know, TCGs went from kind of being player focused to being collectible focused. And, you know, you can see this on like YouTube, go look up content about Pokemon cards. And there's a lot more people opening po packs of Pokemon cards than there are people playing Pokemon. And so that wasn't necessarily great because it kind of destroyed the core function of, of what was meant to be a game. Then it switched, right? Like people started playing DC, uh, TCGs that were digital, like Hearthstone. Um, and, and that was completely centralized. So it sort of killed collectability right you just played the game and people love playing the game but over time a lot of people uh leave that or, or or get you know they sort of you know kind of lose interest because all these really rare digital things that they they own they don't actually own i mean that was that was my experience with hearthstone like i spent over a thousand dollars playing that game and collecting cards and then when i quit i realized that i didn't really own any of this stuff and so nfts as trading cards make so much sense because i think it helps preserve the balance I was speaking to, which is this can be a game that I enjoy. It also can be this digital object that I own. And by the way, the, the cards won't get damaged and the corners won't get ripped because my dirty hands aren't touching them. They're all stored on, on chain. So I'm, I'm really excited as, I mean, as a, as a TCG fan, I think it's the perfect um, genre of games to utilize this technology. So like take away tokenomics and all these complex things, just the really simple idea of of you know creating this like everlasting ownership of this object and allowing me to have fun playing this game and not worrying about um its its permanence uh is beautiful so I'm, I'm glad you guys are all building in this space but curious if, if anybody you know has a counterpoint or uh you know uh, wants to add on to it well i think it's um i think it's very interesting i think you guys spoke to the positives of web3 within the genre very well but I um, personally, I do view it as a as a more sort of multifaceted uh, question because I think the original question was, you know, how are you going to get your first thousand players, or how how are you going to build a, a player base, really, right? So I think you guys spoke very well to the benefits of Web three. However, I think something that is occasionally underconsidered in the space is really how to get more traditional gamers, we'll call them Web two, I guess, gamers, uh, to accept you because. You know, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of controversy, whatever. I don't really think any one project is going to cause a pendulum shift there. I think that's going to be a long term, uh, you know, sort of like status quo adoption in time. But nowadays, you still do face that stigma. It's undeniably a difficult thing, right? A lot of people will see your game has Web3, crypto, NFT, whatever elements, and immediately just go, no thanks. So one of the things that I'm very interested in is how do you engage both sides of the coin? Because I think you can build something purely for Web3 people and it can be great, fantastic. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But personally, I think that you can also aim towards pleasing both sides. And I think it's something that we're doing kind of an interesting attempt at in parallel. And I guess time will tell how it works, right? But we're feeling fairly confident in it. And what I wanted to do in parallel from day one, actually, one of the things I said when I joined back in April 21 was... Yeah, very happy to work on this. Remember, I wasn't really in Web3 at all at that point, but I was like, yeah, very happy to work on this. However, one of the things that I'm going to insist on is that everyone can play this game. Like, you know, you don't need an NFT collection. You can play, you can play parallel without even having a wallet. Um, and that's something that I think that we've very strongly factored in. You can play parallel in any depth of experience from 
being a free-to-play player, you could play without even knowing what Web3 is. Like, you might just see an advert, think the franchise looks cool, see some of our amazing art, and be like, hey, sci-fi card game, cool, yeah, I'll play that. And you can download it and play it. Or you can go all the way to the other way, and if you're interested in, you know, trading and stuff like that, you can essentially operate as like a card store if you wanted to. So one of the things that we really focused on from day one was supporting as many different approaches to the game as possible. Because, you know, everybody here likes Web3, right? We all love the technology, we all love the potential. But I don't want to be, uh, you know, like too self-focused in who the game is for. And I want everybody to enjoy the game. Like I, like I said, I just, no matter how you approach the game, I want something to be there for you. You know, if you're a competitive player, you can come and play our tournaments. If you're a competitive player interested in Web3, you can come and play our tournaments for Prime. Um, all the way down to, yeah, like, like I say, you might just see an art and be like, oh, wow, that's cool. What game is this? And just casually play it. So I think one thing that will really help the space in time, and like I say, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a more focused product for Web3 people, but I think one thing that will really help the space in time is is more companies taking the approach of like, okay, how do we make this acceptable to all genres? Because then, of course, we reach the uh, the golden goal, right? You know, I'm talking about taking any approach, but ultimately, you want all of those approaches to kind of cross-pollinate and blend together, right? So you might get that casual player who, I don't know, maybe they play for a couple of weeks and then they're like, oh, I can just, like, trade someone for the deck I want? Great, I'll just, you know, get rid of some of the cards I don't want and I'll trade them for their deck. Or you get the more hardcore financial trading people being like, you know what, actually, uh, I'll just give the game a go. Let's see if it's fun. And eventually, you know, they all kind of blend together. And that's when you get a really solid, broad, like divergent community, which I think has been my long-term goal. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to think about. (laughs) Part of, but I think what I'd love to dig in on a little bit is, because I I totally agree with you. It's like the, the, the category of player needs to be, Mm -hmm. you know, needs to, needs to speak to the full spectrum, but like, when it comes to the actual rails of how you engage with people that aren't familiar with Web3, obviously this is a topic we, we all talk about daily. Um, how, how are you guys like approaching that? And, 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 and why do you think it's it, it, you have a shot at, at making it happen? Beyond just sure, making so a beautiful game. For sure. Yeah, I mean, making a beautiful game is a, is a big one to start with. But uh, no, of course, there's more to it than that, right? It's a very, very hard thing to do. You know, I think it's... Um, you know, it's like one of my favorite things to bear in mind is like you can do everything right and you can still fail, which I'm completely stealing from Picard and Star Trek. But like, it's true. So what you have to do is you really have to try to think of as many points of approach as you can. And for me, at least in my design philosophy, it was all about layers of engagement. So let's think about it this way, right? Level one of engaging with Parallel is you see the game, you go, oh, that looks cool. You go to the website, you download it, create an account, you play the game. From there you will naturally see and you will naturally encounter further levels of exposure. And of course, this is coming in as a Web2 gamer. You know, you will eventually be introduced to concepts like card replication. You will naturally be introduced to, you know, NFT versions of cards that you are told you can go and acquire through, you know, whatever second party you want to. There's a lot of things that you can just see. However, while you're not... Sorry if you can hear my cats meowing, by the way, but uh, there's lots of different layers that you will naturally see and encounter in your journey as a player. And you can choose to engage with them or not. Like, the incentives of doing so will be made pretty clear to you. But you can still ignore them and just play the game if you want to. Like, you know, I'm... Maybe this sounds weird, but as a game designer, the most rewarding thing in the world to me is just people wanting to play the games that I make, right? And I think everyone on the Parallel team thinks that. You know, there's a lot of us making this game. And we want people to enjoy it. So we're not going to say like, hey, you've played 20 games. Now go get some NFTs or stop playing. Absolutely not. If you're enjoying the game, go for it. We love you. Thank you for playing. Like, And that's kind of how you naturally expose people coming in from the Web 2 side. And I think similarly from the uh, Web 3 side, I think the level one of engagement there is uh, taking part in the drops, collecting the cards, and then looking to essentially flip them, right? Like you're engaging with the project, but you're not engaging with the product, if that makes sense. Um, and I think the natural way that we can tempt those people in is with things like tournaments for Prime. You know, we can do competitions where... Um, so like one thing that we're planning to do is, you know, on the on our Battle Pass system, if you get the max level, you'll get an NFT of a featured card. 
Um, and, you know, that's going to naturally tempt in a lot of people who are collecting, and it's also going to expose a lot of the Web2 gamers to the NFT side of things. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff we can do like that. And I think that really I've just I've spent so long. Sorry if I'm rambling. I've just spent so long thinking about and, you know, trying to implement things like this along with people like Kalos, along with people like Mr. Gon. Um, you know, we've all had our own ideas for this. and We've all kind of like worked together to try and create as much of a multifaceted approach and engage as many different kinds of players as we can with different journeys. But that ultimately end up in the same spot, which is no matter how you do it, just enjoying parallel. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very complex topic, but it's a fascinating one. And it's something that I think um, is beginning to emerge in the space, which is fantastic to see because... I don't think that we compete against each other. Like, you know, like with the runes TCG and stuff. Yeah, I'm going to check it out after this. Sounds awesome. Like, I hope you smash it. You know, rising tide raises all ships. It really does. So, yeah, I love seeing things like that emerge more in the space. And just, just to kind of highlight, I, I think um, awesome. And I'm, I mean, I've been following Parallel for, for a long time. So huge, huge, huge fan. So um, let me know what you think about runes. I'd love to, love to chat about it. And I think sure. just uh, just to kind of highlight what we were talking about. I feel like it's funny. Like I literally, this entire conversation has also been about like building trust. I feel like in like what you mm-hmm. mentioned, like whether someone's coming from Web two or Web three, it's about building trust, right? Like you don't want to like prompt a user with to oh hey now we get an NFT too soon, right? Or or even ever because then you're starting to diminish that trust. You're breaking. You're like oh yep. wait oh what are they why why am I playing this game? Why like what are they re- like? Do they have some agenda? And so um, it's really, you know, or when they're coming from the Web3 side, if you layer in, you know, Pontionomics to, you know, or, or if you start to kind of like introduce like predatory tokenomics, or if the game is less about the gameplay and more about the flipping and economy, then it's like, then it starts to degrade that trust, right? And so um, I think it really comes down to, yeah, just building trust and like Bear mentioned his time, right? And like trust takes time to build, right? And you have to build a trust by a reputation that, that shows that the actions you take are in the best interest of the players and best interest of the community. Right. And, and like you said, we all help each other because we need to be the change we want to see in this space, right? Like we all need to make good decisions so that we can then as a whole change the perception of crypto and web three, right? Because they get like, Mm -hmm. so we totally nailed it. Not one project is going to do that. It's going to be all of us changing the narrative collectively um, and, and kind of like, and, and yeah, so when, when one of us does well, and when one of us, you know, pushes that narrative forward a little bit, it, it's like, it's, it's for the best of all of us, 100%. Exactly. And I think like, just to, just to cap it off, I guess, I think a great ethos to take away from it is you need to illustrate to people that blockchain, I would say that to include everything, you know, like blockchain technology is an asset for a game. It is not the definition of a game, you know? And I think when people start thinking about it that way, they'll realize that it's a it's a positive force to just include in otherwise great games, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, Bear, I wanted to just uh, circle back real quick. I mean, I'm not sure if this is what you were alluding to when you when you threw the question to me, but um, runes. If I don't know if we want to talk about runes, has kind of like the benefit of the fact that we're building as part of the universe, right? It's like it's this decentralized kind of IP, and it's 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 it actually is a similar similar concept to the rising tide uh raises all ships it's like you know uh for rune specifically like we're building in the runeverse and when other projects within the universe do well that kind of helps exposure to all of us and so it's a really unique approach to to this to to kind of this thing where you know runeverse games coming out the comic book the tv show like all this stuff is going to kind of going to kind of help compound each other and and each each project is like a data point that helps kind of like people triangulate all these different stories that are happening so so yeah runes has that little uh that's that's our little secret sauce is that uh that we we're part of this other little community that's that, that has a rising tide as well the ecosystem is really important right like i think games in general we're seeing more and more ecosystems like arise and being able to create loops for multiple players right like we talk about the word of like gamers being like too too vague and too big like well within ecosystems you really can have all the smaller components that make people happy when they play a game. Like you can have a cozy comfy that sits within the certain IP, but also like a really competitive PVP game as well. Like you get to pick where they exist and then I'll hopefully attach them with either lore or other things that would like help um, push them all forward, right? So the word ecosystem to me is like super important within gaming in like the last few years. And I think it will continue to be so in like the future.
Well, awesome. Uh, Barrett, you think we should uh, invite some, some people up to uh, ask questions or contribute to the conversation? It's been yeah, awesome so yeah. Far. blew through an hour. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that, it's, it's gone quickly. Yeah, if anyone has uh, any questions, uh, just request on stage. Happy to happy to field anything. Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, the, the, the future is bright here, and 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 I know that. I, I think I'm not sure if board. I think you're going, and I'm not sure if you're coming, uh, Merchant. But the this game conference that's specifically around Web three uh, three XP is happening. Uh, right outside of Los Angeles, um, I, yeah. I recommend I recommend anyone who's in the greater LA area to come check it out. I actually think they're streaming some of the panels too, so a lot, lots of good conversations happening um, coming out of that on Thursday and Friday. Yeah, sort of poetic. Uh, E3 is not happening this year, and uh, you know, a conference that's dedicated specifically to this industry is obviously much much smaller, and uh, cost for uh, exhibition is, is is lower. But nonetheless, I mean, there's there's demand, and I think anybody who's been paying attention to the 3XP uh, conversations online uh, knows there's a lot of excitement and, and people coming together. So it it makes me happy to see it because I'm somebody who came from the game industry and started to really question, like, what is the point of PAX and E3 and all these really expensive events, and do we even need to do them? Um, and the answer for many of those is no, but I think in this case – all of us digital nerds who spend time on spaces and never actually seeing each other do benefit a little bit from coming together and hearing from each other live. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested to see what comes out of it. Um, unfortunately, the reason I'm on this space is because Carlos and Gon are currently flying to 3XP and I'm not. So unfortunately, <laughs> you got the third stringer here. But uh, yeah, no, I'm very interested to see what comes out of it. I mean, to be honest, they, they, they said you had a good radio voice and they weren't lying. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just stayed behind so I can watch baseball. Don't worry about this. <laughs> uh, uh, Delso, you came up on stage. You have a question? Hey, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, I kind of touched on it uh, a little bit and uh, and I was uh, bringing it up in Forgotten Red's, uh Discord chat. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'm interested in to hear uh, opinions from people uh in regards to uh centralized server gaming and then uh being able to use assets that are worthwhile out of out of that game uh to bring them on chain and uh and create nfts uh from them so then uh you don't have uh this on-chain game loop where things without value cost cost players money um, and, you know, I mean, uh, the parallel, the, the idea that you can play the game without uh, even knowing that it's Web3 means that the game is uh, not completely, you know, decentralized on chain, so on and so forth. There is yeah, power, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really that, uh, that you have the ability to participate without, um, without needing to uh, pay money for transactions, right? Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. I think um, sort of, okay, so I guess maybe a spicy take is I don't think every game suits decentralization. You know, I think there are some games out there. Um, I actually think Diablo 4 that just came up earlier is a fairly good example. Um, you know, that's the kind of game where you could argue that, well, you can certainly use blockchain for other things like meta progression and stuff, but strictly talking about like items and assets. Um, you probably don't really want it there because that's kind of the whole point of the game, right? Is to progress and get your gear and whatnot. And, you know, it would sort of quickly stumble into the dreaded pay to win category where you were able to trade and sell your assets. In fact, Diablo 3 actually did that in sort of a very early, strange, weird, nightmare version of decentralization with the real money auction house at the beginning of Diablo 3. And it was not good. I, I um, love Diablo 3. I'm, I'm $50 times a day <laughs> sorry you cut out a little bit there what did you say oh i i said i i loved that portion of diablo 3 the auction house was great i you know I, I, sitting at the bar watching watching the emails come in saying you know hey, you made <laughs> multiple times throughout the day yeah but then again you know that's when we come down to the uh sustaining different approaches right so general consensus was that the auction house was extremely unpopular and it sort of damaged the core integrity of the early life cycle of Diablo 3. So, and it's interesting because neither side is right or wrong there, but what we're talking about is making a game sustainable um, and really kind of 
encouraging a healthy enough player base through different approaches. So yeah, it's interesting. And in the case of Parallel, obviously, you know, it's nowhere near that extreme because you could buy a tier one deck and you can still, let's say, not be the best player. And, uh, you know, it may, it may all be for naught, dare I say. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we do have decentralized options as well as centralized game services for people who want to engage with them. But the nice thing is, unlike something like Diablo, where, you know, you are strictly becoming more powerful in a way that other players couldn't really match at the same pace in uh parallel you can absolutely take the web 2 web 3 approach somewhere in the middle and have parity with all other players there's no sort of a pay for power if you like so i think it's good to maintain the separate approaches for sure yeah i mean it, you know for for me it's it's also things like uh, i forget what uh, planet plant 4 i think was one of the the recent popular uh games on polygon and uh you know i mean they had uh, some some contract issues but uh there were like you know four four contracts or so that uh were were costing players something like forty thousand dollars a day in gas oh. and then you know you oh, and, and you say it's on polygon transactions are cheap but there's so many play you know there's you know sixty thousand a hundred thousand players whatever um, and then, and then you add up everything for all the different transactions that they're doing uh, on a daily basis, and and you now have this ecosystem that is is draining a million dollars a month just to play. And and that's uh, crazy. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look into that because that sounds uh, pretty, pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, but it, so so it, it really is that that is is on chain gaming an approach that that we can use for gamers, considering that the the uh, you have to pay to play it's a pay to play model right in order mm. to participate, you have to transact uh and and if you are transacting absolutely you play right yeah so i think um and again this is truly only my opinion um i think purely on chain in that sense from a scalability standpoint currently no unless companies are willing to front the cost of that occurring um because I think, again, you know, it goes down to like value propositions, right? You're already asking people to spend money so that you make money, essentially, and you know you can sustain and grow your studio. Um, when it comes to like the actual transactional cost of playing, that's why I believe uh, at the moment on-chain activity is best suited to meta elements of the game like collection, like progression, stuff like that. So actually, uh, does, I think, obviously, uh, it's a really good question. I think, so finally, I think NFT like trading card games uh, are suited well for blockchain, not only for because NFTs and cards are very alike, but also NFTs typically they typically are like I would say like low frequency transaction games. Like you know I don't know. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but like and when you're playing a trading card game, like you're not like you know it's not like this very very complex like ecosystem. You're not some MMORPG where there's like this like whatever blah 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 like. Um, to to have like a trading card game be on chain is a little bit different than let's say like Eve Online be on chain or like yeah you're talking about real time versus turn based right, you can exactly. basically submit single so, like, actions on but, so that's something that TCGs have going for us at least when it comes to on chain gaming but but I totally like but I totally think you're hitting on a thing that is uh, I think super important uh, a I think it, well it just comes down to being diligent about how you're going about implementing your game and being very cognizant cognizant about how you're interacting with the blockchain and what you're using it for. I mean, um, Merchant said it or um, said it before. It's like not everything suited for blockchain, and I think that even goes. I think that's even relevant when you're talking about things within a game, right? Like part of the game could leverage blockchain. Part of the game doesn't have to. Um, and so, or or again, like if a user wants to transition to being on chain, that that can be an option. Um, but I also think like uh, yeah, you know, you, you want to be on a, a blockchain that supports high you know high uh high load of transactions and then there's things that companies can do to also like pay for gas there's you know there's basically for the benefit of transactions where um you know you can basically the company can sign transactions for the player and stuff like that so there's different techniques to get around some of that stuff but uh, it's obviously you know i think we're you know the like hashtag we're we're early you know tm uh we're we're still figuring some of the stuff out we're still figuring out the technologies but but i do think it's a it's a great War, you know, uh, the story you brought up is a great warning about um, being very thoughtful about how you go actually about implementing the game um, and, and what are you actually using blockchain for uh, and, and what, you know, because it doesn't come for free, like you mentioned. 
Yeah, and, and ultimately, uh, perhaps this is a spicy take, but um, you know, making games takes time, takes people, takes money, and uh, not everything necessarily needs to be a transaction that happens on chain. I think it's also okay for blockchain games to have things like subscriptions and um, you know, having people pay for stuff they love. Some of that can be on chain and kind of forever in the game, and, and other things can be impermanent or, or centralized. And nobody really likes to talk about that, but I mean that is how video games work, and I think it's okay for that to continue uh, with with Web three. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that the the centralized take that yeah nobody likes to talk about is it, it's how games have been forever. Online games <laughs> have have gone through a centralized uh, system forever, and you know, I mean, I understand that um, y- you know, like being able to do stuff like uh, provable uh, randomization um, that can be important, um, you know, if if any of you guys have, have played Path of Exile, uh, there's a lot of, you know, conspiracy rumors about how uh, streamers get better roles, you know, they get better drops, um, so on and so forth. Obviously, it's because they play, you know, 10 hours more than everybody else a day. But, uh, but you know, the, the pro- provable randomization makes sense uh, when it comes to, to blockchain gaming, but you can also have a centralized server that has provable randomization so it's a it's a, a interesting conversation and uh i enjoyed it thank you for for uh the discussion yeah absolutely thanks for coming up looks like we got uh, bridge joining and based on his avatar might be a friend of bears i have no idea who this person is don't let him up don't let him up Bridge, do you have something to say? Oh, no, Question? No, I, I just, uh, I just was uh, walking by and I heard uh, some interesting gaming conversations going on. Board brings up an amazing point about hybrid, hybridizing um, assets in games, and I, I think it's not talked about a lot. That like you do have the option of having USD in one corner and and NFTs utilized in another, and I think that's a really cool conversation to touch on. That like you can use these assets for specific purposes and i think you you open the door to a lot of different users when you do that and you don't have like specifically blockchain assets in game that people are either alienated from or gravitating towards but more familiar assets like just usd or subscriptions i think that's a huge topic i really found that interesting yeah, I mean, as as mentioned earlier, gamers are not this uh, homogenous group of people. There's a spectrum of what people expect. There's people with neck beards who only play on a PC, and then there's people who play uh, mobile games, and people like different genres. And like everybody likes to argue about what is a what is a gamer, but ultimately, uh, if you're spending your time interacting with, uh, you know, some sort of digital interface and you're enjoying it, it might be a game. So I think like, in the same sense, uh, if, if you're offering players and different types of players experiences that make sense for them, uh, we can think about that from a blockchain perspective as well. I don't think we have to be necessarily maximalist. If there's if there's a market for it, then let's explore it and give people the option, right? Like there are going to be game producers who they want to build on Bitcoin and their game will last for a thousand years after the aliens are here and, and humans are all gone. And then there's people who want to build games for like 10 years or less. And it'll be a fun experience and you move on. So, uh, yeah, give the people what they want. Yeah, Having the options is important, right? Like, and so I was talking about, like, the modding community, like, something that I think will do really well in Web3 if we, like, approach it the right way. Um, giving people the ability to keep on building upon something. I mean, some of the biggest games in the world come out of modding, right? Like Dota, like, for example, back in the Warcraft 3 engine, and now it's, like, one of the biggest games in the world. Counter-Strike, arguably the best FPS ever made, also a mod. So it's just, like... Giving people the option to build and know what they want to play, like living within the categories, like that's that's a win, right? So cool to hear. So I think we're going to wrap up. We're a little bit over time. Um, you know, I want to you know thank you everybody for for coming on stage. This is the first episode. Uh, there's a bunch more coming. A lot of fun guests. Hope some of you guys uh, can come back and, and talk with us. Um, you know, uh, give a hoot. And and Hawkins uh, is it, it, just last chance to you know mention anything that's coming up. If any, you know, to talk to uh, the people in the space, and you know, it, it, last last chance to chill. You want to go ahead, Gib? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Feel free to check out. Um, so the project Twitter account is uh, linked in my bio. Um, 
runes at runes underscore tcg uh the mint is still ongoing like i said it's it's an indefinite mint where you can mint uh card packs for 0.005 eth or a special edition for 0.015 uh wanted wanted basically there to be no financial barrier to get in so um so you know go mint a pack uh you can open the pack on the website and uh we tried to you know, in the in the theme of immersive experiences and you know lore and art, uh, we had uh, two Forgotten Runes community members collaborate with us. Uh, Doctor Slurp, who uh, did music, and Tad Major, who did the animation. So the pack animation, uh, you know, we're we're I would I would consider us an indie game if we're uh, you know relative to maybe something like Parallel or uh, or Final Form. So you know, uh, we we're uh, we're coming from a humble place, but. Uh, the, the pack opening animation is super fun. Uh, so go experience it. Uh, the artists, there are seven artists uh, from within the cult and outside the cult who um, are amazing pixel artists. And so, uh, and they, they get generous royalties for all this stuff because where, where would we be without the artists? So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, go check out the project. If you have any feedback, let me know. DM me on Twitter, DM me on discord. I'm uh, at give a hoot. Um, you know, they'll find me, find me whenever if you, you know, I'm kind of anywhere forgotten runes is and just on Twitter and discord and stuff. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me up, uh, bear and board. Um, this is amazing. I feel, uh, again, honored and humbled, um, uh, uh, merchant, uh, and, uh, and I guess, and Sobi was on pleasure talking to both of you as well. You're building amazing things and, uh, yeah, can't wait to see what we all do. Can confirm that the pack opening is, uh, a fantastic experience. Um, Merchant, you want to go ahead? Last thing, tell us about yeah, what's coming up thing. next. Yeah, thank you. Well, first off, thank you guys for having me on. It's been fun. It's nice to always nice to chat with other people uh, building in the space and some fellow TCG guys. But uh, yeah, honestly, the the main thing to do just make sure you're following us, Parallel TCG on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you literally just go on there and scroll like the first ten posts, you'll get a pretty good impression of the myriad of absolutely crazy stuff that we're working on right now. Uh, there are so many talented people that it's an honor to work with and yeah we're making some crazy and some scary and some very impressive stuff so go and check that out it's a lot of fun uh beta coming up in july of course so that's the best place to get notified about that as well i hope to see you all in game uh yeah of course as well just drop me a follow if you have any questions about the game side of parallel anything like that i'm more than happy to answer all the time i am pretty terminally online so i will probably get to your questions and uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me on. It's been fun. Awesome. Great to have you. Um, all right. Well, end of the first episode of Game Changers. Guys, thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, let's get the music going. We'll wrap and, and we'll see you next Tuesday, uh, uh, 8.30 a.m. PST, um, with a whole new set of fantastic builders in the game space. Uh, we will catch you guys later. Board anything? Uh, thanks for being a great co-host. This is super fun, and I'm looking forward to next Tuesday. Awesome. All right. Take it easy, everyone. Mm-hmm.